Thank you so much, Jennifer, for that very generous introduction. And I'd just like to start by thanking the organizers of this gathering for inviting me to participate, and particularly Thierry Porte and to Hidaka Sawako and team for all of their work in, in preparing all of this. I'd also like to thank you for turning out so early in the morning or for tuning in wherever you might be. Uh, and thank you for being here because uh, for me, it's the first time back to Japan in about five years. So uh, for me in particular, it's a very precious opportunity to reconnect with uh, so many figures uh, working here in the art world um, as we sort of collectively try and figure out, we grapple with how we're going to move forward in this uh, so-called new normal. So my talk today aims to introduce some of the features of the work that goes on at the Harvard Art Museums that might be a little bit different from the kind of work that is most familiar to general audiences in presentations at national or civic museums, for example. As you know, the uh, Harvard Art Museums is a university museum, and it's situated on Harvard's campus in Cambridge, Massachusetts, nested within the institutional structures of the university. It has a long history as a teaching museum, and its earliest directors, in fact, explicitly conceptualized it as a quote-unquote laboratory for the arts, which was an impulse that grew out of a foundational interest, not only in art history, but in conservation, conservation science, materials, and in making. This multifaceted approach has ebbed and flowed a bit with both institutional and intellectual developments over time, but it has remained embedded within the DNA of the museums and is again at the core of some of its most successful work today. Now, in the short time that we have together, I'm going to briefly introduce some of the museum's history and then take a look at some of the, the programs that we're pursuing today. I'm going to end with a uh, case study of recent work on a Japanese sculpture at the museums through the type, which is this is work that has become possible um, at the museums through the type of transdisciplinary collaboration that its new institutional architecture can now support. Now, this case study is just one among many uh, projects, but it's a good example of how awareness of this museum's particular ecology can be most generatively activated in tandem with, rather than being dominated or restricted by, the disciplinary conventions of a single field. And as Jennifer said, often in the case of museums, this is assumed to be art history, which is a situation that over time stifles access and ultimately also the evolution of the discipline itself. For many of us at the Harvard Art Museums, where we have art historians working alongside scientists, this is a particularly critical point in the context of the much discussed so-called death of the humanities in US higher education today. So to begin with a brief history of the art museums. The museum that we, uh, we know today uh, originated with the establishment of the Fogg Museum in 1895. The original space was a quite modest building on the northern edge of Harvard's campus. But in 1927, a gift from Mrs. Elizabeth Fogg allowed the museum to move to its current location on Quincy Street. Uh, the early collections were renowned for Western paintings, sculpture, prints, and drawings, and included a large number of plaster casts and photographs of original works of art. Now, today, the Fogg Museum is one of three museums, the Fogg Museum, the Bush Freisinger Museum, and the Sackler Museum, that collectively constitute the Harvard Art Museums, with an S on the end, that awkward S at the end there. Now, the Bush Reisinger Museum, which was established in 1903, is dedicated to modern Germanic art, and the Sackler Museum, uh, which was established in 1985, is the home of the collections of Asian and Mediterranean art. The, con the consolidation of the three museums was completed in 2014 after an extensive rebuilding project that brought all three together under one roof, along with the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies, which is often cited as the birthplace of conservation in North America. <clears throat> Now, the building is a re-articulation in steel, stone, and glass of the museum's mission to be an open experimental space where students and visitors can engage with the unfamiliar, the complex, and the rare, and to participate in experiential, collaborative, and open learning. 
Now, practicing active learning in this way in the museums is explicitly intended to expand conventional channels of perception and to break through habituated frames of reference to equip Harvard students with a toolbox of skills that can be used logically, responsibly, and generously when encountering unfamiliar concepts and ideas elsewhere in their lives. Now, the new building was designed to enable this kind of learning across many disciplines and to facilitate the museum's role as an integral part of the university as a whole, functioning as something like a teaching machine engaged in transformation of thinking across disciplines. And these range from medicine and law to justice, the hard sciences, and from literature to, to neuroscience and beyond. In the last few years, the mission has extended to be more inclusive of community, be, uh, of community beyond the immediate residents, the student residents on campus, for the museums to act as something of a front porch to the university. Now, this is an effort that is ongoing, but has been greatly assisted by recent changes in admissions policies, which now enable most visitors to visit free of charge, and by the establishment of a monthly after-hours late night, which has proved enormously popular and effective in encouraging new visitors to the museums. During the 2014 renovation, the historic brick facade and the inner courtyard were retained from the 1927 building, but almost every other aspect was radically changed. The most obvious of these changes was the addition of this spectacular glass roof, which was engineered so that controlled daylight became one of the building blocks of the structure. Um, the deployment of daylight in this way is also powerfully symbolic in that one of the driving concerns in the renovation of the museums was to construct a modern laboratory for the arts that was physically as well as cognitively open and transparent so that not only the curated works of art but also the inner workings of the museum were exposed to public view. Within this new physical structure, the museums support a robust exhibition program, including two special exhibitions a year. And I'm showing you here some images from our 2020 exhibition of, it was a special exhibition of Japanese art, the Feinberg Collection, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, it was an exhibition named Painting Edo. Unfortunately, it opened in February 2020, so it largely went online, but um, we, still, we still have these photos of the opening night here for you. There are also smaller scale exhibitions in the university research, teaching and study galleries, which rotate three times a year. And Japanese art is always on view in our permanent collections gallery. And this is a view, uh, actually this is the current rotation. Um, uh, and of course this work is really visually conspicuous, but uh, much of it would not be possible without the less publicly visible teaching and research practices on which it is based. The museums lead and support a wide variety of object-based teaching on campus, and this involves museum staff from many departments, including curatorial, conservation, design, and collections management. Curricular engagement is managed by our Department of Academic and Public Programs, who captured some statistics for 2022. And I'm going to share with you here just to give you a sense of what goes on. So in 2022, uh, the Harvard Art Museum staff taught for 69 different Harvard courses, which were offered by 31 departments and schools within the university. And these included African and uh, African American studies, art, film, and visual studies, classics, East Asian languages, the Harvard Business School, Harvard Medical School, Harvard Law School, the History of Art and Architecture Department, music, romance languages, social studies, the Writing Center, and on and on and on. Um, a number of special collaborations are ongoing, including with the Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is a large hospital in Boston. They have a radiology program there, and we ran a class called Seeing in Art and Medicine, uh, which we can talk about later in the question and answer uh, session, if you like. This is particular, <clears throat> excuse me, a favorite of mine. We also collaborate with the School of Education and Graduate Student Teacher Training, and with a local organization that supports residents seeking to pass the U.S. naturalization test by offering citizenship classes at the museums. 
The museums also offer professional training at several levels, and these encompass various undergraduate opportunities, including serving on the museum's student board and a limited number of paid internships at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. At the postdoctoral level, several endowed fellowships allow the museums to host a, a limited cohort of postdoctoral fellows who are seeking to enter the views, museum field as curators or as conservators. And they usually stay for two years, and this allows them to gain the critical museum experience necessary to advance. This kind of training is not usually provided in doctoral programs in art history. And so this is really the sort of last mile problem in the curatorial field in North America. While the majority of these curatorial fellowships in European and in American art at the museums have historically been endowed, we currently have no endowed fellowships in Asian art, which is a situation that we're proactively seeking to address. Returning for a moment to the undergraduate level, one of our signature programs is the Ho Family Student Guide program. Successful applicants to this paid program are admitted to a year-long training during which they learn, through interactions with a wide variety of museum staff, how to create and lead original research-based tours of the collections for the public. No art history or museum experience is necessary, and student guides have come from a wide range of academic backgrounds that this year include chemistry, applied mathematics, astrophysics, philosophy, government, history, history of art, and literature. The rigorous training allows them to gain knowledge of the collection and to develop skills in critical thinking, visual analysis, public speaking, and public engagement. And the goal with each tour is less to advance an argument uh, than it is to facilitate a conversation. Now, to give you a sense of what happens, recent tours have been on topics such as nostalgia, hybridity, and decay. And during the pandemic, you can see on the right-hand side of the slide there, one of the guides also developed a series of popular online makeup tutorials that were later picked up and broadcast by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, all of this work happens in a variety of spaces, including classrooms, galleries, and the museum cafe, importantly, but also critically in the art study center. Now, this is a suite of five purpose-built rooms which are designed for the examination of art and as classrooms in which classes can be safely conducted with original works of art. The center is supported by a dedicated team of art handlers and by an online system accessible to anyone uh, for requesting appointments to examine objects. In a museum with a relatively small architectural footprint, but with very extensive collections numbering almost 300,000 objects, the study center is really the beating heart of his activities. In the first year of operations, which was 2014 to 2015, over 40,000 objects went through the study center. So that's really an extraordinary number of objects in one year. And it's, of course, far more than you could ever show in our galleries. <laughs> Now, the pandemic presented a number of significant challenges, as I'm sure you can imagine, but we are beginning to see a return to pre-pandemic levels of activity. And between September 2022 and May 2023, for example, which is our current academic year, 23,084 objects were viewed in the study center, which was used for 331 class meetings. And I'm happy to say that of the objects requested, over 7,000 were from the Asian collections. I'd just like to introduce one more long-running teaching program at the museums, and that is the very popular Science and the Practice of Art History class, which is taught by museum staff in the Strauss Center for Conservation. This seminar is a, it's a semester-long seminar that is limited to 12 participants. And they work in three groups, each with a one carefully chosen object, either a painting, a 3D object, or a work on paper. And they work with that one object for the entire semester. The primary task is to grapple with the materiality of the work and to answer several fundamental questions. What is it made of? How is it made? And how has it changed? So what is original and what is restoration? 
And while the questions may seem very simple at the outset, students soon find themselves confronted with the complexity and ambiguity that's inherent in objects that have survived over time. And they quickly come to appreciate the sorts of expertise that is necessary and the types of cross-referencing um, uh, knowledge and generative questioning that arise from seeking basic an answers to these basic questions. Now, over the semester, the groups work with museum staff, including conservation, uh, conservation scientists and uh, curatorial um, staff members to understand the composition of the object, interrogating it and taking it figuratively apart, rather like a forensic crime scene to see how it has come together over time. The groups then progressively share their findings with each other so that by the end of the semester, they're effectively teaching each other. Again, the students come from a very wide variety of backgrounds. Not infrequently, they are students under various pressures to study STEM subjects, but with a personal desire to work with art in some form. One of the basic premises of the course is that there is no right way to encounter art, and that art history, while of course very important, is not the only gateway to experiencing art. If this sounds familiar from my introduction to the founding tenets of the museums, that's because it is. And the class in its current iteration is actually an evolution of a class that became known as the quote unquote museum class, which was taught by the first director of the Harvard Art Museums, Edward Forbes, in the early 20th century. And Forbes developed this class explicitly to offer holistic training for museum professionals in the US when no such programs or indeed any kind of training really existed, despite the proliferation of collecting institutions at the time. Now, the list of graduates of this class who went on to prominent positions at museums in the US and beyond is pretty notable. Uh, this is what the class looked like about 1929. And this is what it looked like, well, it's what it looks like today. So we're still, we're still, uh, we're, we're returning to foundation, foundational principles in a way. So this um, transdisciplinary approach is also characteristic of research and exhibitions produced by museum staff. And I'd like to turn now to a recent example of one project in which close collaboration between what might be loosely described as humanists and scientists has generated both new research and new methodological pathways in the community that's been created through this work over the past several years. The work centers on this sculpture of Prince Shotoko or Shotoku Taishi at age two. Now, this remarkable sculpture, which dates to about 1292, manifests the infant Shotoku Taishi at the moment when, according to his sacred biography, he stood up, faced east, and praised the Buddha, whereupon a Buddha relic appeared in his left hand. Now, this sculpture was brought to Boston in the early 20th century by a man named Ellery Sedgwick. Uh, he was actually the owner and publisher of The Atlantic, a magazine that still continues today. And the sculpture now resides at the Harvard Art Museums, where its existence is apparently utterly other than that for which it was originally conceived. And yet, perhaps this isn't quite true, for it's a sculpture that clearly exudes a peculiar charisma. It has an aura, attracting both those with and without any specific interest in medieval Japanese Buddhist sculpture <laughs> to it. I mean, what more can you say? <laughs> Of all the features of this extremely finely carved sculpture that draw attention, it is, as with a living human being, the face which most fully engages. And much effort has been spent upon uh, interpreting the theoretical affect of the face in various branches of both the arts and the sciences. But it's perhaps above all our communal understanding of the face as a primary site of communication that gener generates the momentary expectation that this sculptural face might actually move, that it might actually look back at you, um, which allows this idealized and perfectly symmetrical face to demand a special mode of attention. The superb modeling, the perfect proportions, and the rock crystal eyes, which are set within very, very thin wooden eyelids, all combine to instantiate a perfected embodiment that is both legibly human and transcendent. Now, the sculpture originally contained a large number of dedicatory uh, objects, or non yuhin, which were removed in 1937 while the sculpture was temporarily at the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. 
All but one of these objects are now at the Harvard Art Museums with the sculpture. This makes it almost uniquely accessible for study among Kamakura period Buddhist sculpture and scholarly excitement and anticipation around the potential for the sculpture to reveal information about Kamakura period Buddhist devotional practice was high at several points in time. The first of these was in the late 1930s, uh, when unfortunately deteriorating international political relations between the US and Japan stymied international collaboration. Then in the 1960s, John Rosenfield uh, wrote a long article on the sculpture and it was published um, actually by the Asia Society, um, but in English only, which meant that it did not circulate well in Japan. And then again, since 2016, when we began uh, our, our renewed effort to, to study the sculpture and all of the contents. The primary question from which we began was, how could we understand this charismatic presence of the sculpture and its continuing effect on visitors, scholars, and pretty much everyone who encountered it? How had it been created both materially and conceptually? And how, in other words, does this sculpture work? As the museum responsible for, for, for the sculpture, critically, we also needed more information in order to understand how best to care for him, not only materially, but also intellectually and spiritually. Now, what unfolded over what is now seven years is a story that's too long to detail here, but suffice it to say, technological advances and the new institutional structures of the museums allowed us to create an international collaboration that now extends over three continents and which, uh, and in which over 100 specialists have now directly participated. To touch on just a few areas of inquiry, um, Technical analysis and technical imaging conducted in collaboration with conservators and specialists at the Harvard Center for Nanoscale Systems allowed us to examine the sculpture literally from the inside out so that we could understand its physical makeup. And this led to overturning some long held beliefs about its construction. Uh, in addition, specialists at Kyoto University, um, at Inalco in Paris, and Harvard's Arnold Arboretum interrogated the basic fabric, the wood, from which the sculpture is made, opening the way to a new understanding of its pre-sculptural life. And Buddhist specialists conducted analysis of all the written documents found inside the sculpture to paint a much fuller picture of its religious context, and even some of the individual nuns who had commissioned the sculpture and donated their own treasured personal belongings to the cache of objects placed inside the figure. We even know some of their names now, which is a really remarkable thing. During the course of our investigations, which began in the conservation labs of the Harvard Art Museums with collaborative close looking, we also ran a graduate seminar on the sculpture in which students wrote final papers on selected individual dedicatory objects from inside the sculpture. And we hosted several international workshops and symposia supported by the Reichau Institute of Japanese Studies at Harvard, which also very generously supported our 2018 exhibition of the sculpture where we presented some of our interim findings. The decision to hold the exhibition as work was ongoing rather than waiting for it to be quote unquote finished was a challenge to normal patterns at Harvard and it was intended to generate further interest and energy around the project. And this is an experiment that did yield uh, various results including the formal gifting of the sculpture to the Harvard Art Museums by Ellery Sedgwick's grandson, Walter Sedgwick. Among the many discoveries facilitated by this transdisciplinary approach, several seem to stand out for our visitors. And these include the fact that we were able to reveal that between the hands of the sculpture, um, there is in fact a lotus seed. You can see that there in the um, x-ray that probably once originally contained a relic grain. Uh, unfortunately, that's now gone. Uh, we also found that this tiny miniature sculpture of Yakshinyorai, the medicine Buddha, you can see by the size of my thumb in the picture there how tiny it is. This sculpture was actually uh, placed inside the larger sculpture of Sotoko Taishi after being wrapped inside an incantation against epidemics. 
So medicine Buddha inside and incantation to keep away illness. And that was a discovery that was made during the pandemic by one of our conservators. And this little sculpture here is about 12 centimeters high. This is Isaiah Muir. Um, this sculpture is, uh, still, is still raising a lot of questions, particularly around the selection of what you can see is pretty unsuitable type of wood for carving. Uh, it's got very large pores, it's very soft, and it wasn't big enough to complete the entire sculpture. So a lot of questions came out of uh, looking at this sculpture, including about why this type of wood might have been chosen and what the date, what it, implications it might have for the dating of the sculpture too. Many questions still remain, and ultimately it may not be completely possible to resolve, for example, exactly how all of the dedicatory objects were arranged inside the sculpture originally. But it's really the work of continuing to ask these questions. Uh, it's that work in which we generate further, usually unanticipated questions, and sometimes we also find answers. Um, more questions than answers, obviously. But uh, these, continuing to ask these questions is really what brings us to the implications of the project that go far beyond the original sculpture itself. In a very real sense, the community that has been generated arises from attention, as far as is possible, to the original object itself, which was created in community, for community, although of a very different sort from its current community, but where it nevertheless continues to work today. Most recently, uh, in March, almost 100 years after the research on the sculpture began, Together with key collaborators at Nagoya University, including Abe Yasuro and Abe Mika and Chikamoto Kensuke, uh, our colleague from uh, Tokyo National Museum, Seiya Ai, and uh, from the Kanazawa Bunko, Seiya Takayuki. Um, Seiya Ai is here with us this morning, I think. Um, we have just published a trans transdisciplinary publication of record that's dedicated to the sculpture. <clears throat> and this has been published by uh, Chuo Korong Bijutsu Shippan. Um, Thanks to the heroic efforts of editor Mr. Suzuki, who was also here this morning and very kindly actually brought a copy of the book, which came out like this. So we're all thrilled. Thank you, Suzuki san. <laughs> um, so thanks to, thanks to all of these, uh, these joint efforts, we really have reached this wonderful milestone in this long running project now. But it's also the jumping off point for, for continuing to learn from the lessons of the past. We know that we need an English language volume now. So that will be the next thing and the ripples continue to spread. So I hope that this introduction has been able to convey a sense of how the art museums functions or how they aspire to function as a teaching museum, which is self-conscious about its nature as both a physical location and as a conceptual structure that can facilitate generative reflection and engage critical thinking through transdisciplinary encounters with the out of the ordinary. This is a constant work in progress, of course, and in that spirit, I would very much welcome your questions, your comments, and your feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that really interesting um, uh, presentation. I think that for me, I learned a lot about how dynamic the idea of a museum as a kind of a teaching laboratory is. And I guess I hadn't realized the full potential and all the different elements to that. Um, I think we'll start with, I maybe have two questions. And the first one is, you know, obviously you took us into the whole um, study of the uh, sculpture of Prince Shotoku at two, and, and congratulations on producing the book. I think what was so interesting is that you pointed out the original connection with uh, John Rosenfeld mm -hmm. and the Asia Society, starting that journey, I think, which made all of us quite happy. But I think the what was surprising to me, and I don't know if it's sort of unique to Harvard, but the, the level of international collaboration and the tools that you have now and the fact that you could, you know, utilize the university resources as well as that outreach. Do you think this is really kind of the future now of, of restoration art? And, and how do you see Harvard in your role as a curator at a, you know, at a, um, at a university such as Harvard with three museums that have come together and with the focus now on kind of the preservation of the original building and the and utilizing modern architecture to kind of bring all the pieces together. I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you sort of see the future for you as a curator and for that collaboration? Thank you for that question. I think, and um, firstly, I have to say, I just 
feel enormously grateful to be in this position. Um, you know, as we all know, Harvard is a very well-resourced place. It, it does a lot. Uh, almost anything you can think of is available on campus, and anything you can't think of usually is also there. So I think we are very, very fortunate, and that's, that has a long history, and it's an ongoing, uh, as it's a work in progress always. So I don't think um, I would want to hold it up as you know a model for other, for other institutions to try and emulate. I think that it's something that has come together over very many years with very many people working in a number of different areas to, to create this very special situation that we have been able to take advantage of. What I do think is important for us at Harvard and for me as a curator is to be able to share that for it not to be something that's just, you know, Harvard's own castle, as it were. And that's what we've tried to do in this collaboration. We have tried to, we have needed other people's expertise, of course. Um, and so we have reached out, but we've also been able to share that, all of our results back out to other people. So that's, we're trying to create a, I guess, a virtuous cycle in a way, so that it's a win-win for everybody. Harvard has these resources, can use these resources, and then the more we use them with other people, the more it generates. Um, results, as it were. I, I also think, I mean, the long history of conservation and conservation science at the museums is important, but what is transformational is the new building where we're now so physically close to each other. I know in this, this era of, you know, off-site storage and off-site libraries and, oh, you can look everything up online, of course you can do all of those things and there is a certain efficiency to that, but there is nothing that beats being able to just run up the stairs to the conservation lab when you need to, um, and that's, it's in those sort of in-between moments, those unstructured moments that things happen. <laughs> and so it's that human connection that's so important. Um, and I think, you know, just being able to have people visit and go to visit, bring people together, that's, of course, where the, where the magic is. I think the other thing that, you know, also struck me before I open it to the rest of, of the people here, I'm sure many of you have questions, was just that the, not only the student engagement, but the community outreach and the number of, of classes um, that come to actually engage with the museum. And I think you mentioned a collaboration between, um, that you wanted me to ask about, right? Between um, one of the hospitals, right? And art, and for me, I think, you know, all of us that are passionate about art that are here in this room, we're always looking for a heightened awareness, engagement, and how to get that in a way that continues to excite people and keep them engaged, as you said, in the humanities and the arts is a big area. So if you can maybe use that as an example of even how we can think about maybe more community outreach, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Well, the, the program with the hospital, the Brigham and Women's Hospital, it's one of the largest hospitals in, in Boston, and it's one of Harvard's teaching hospitals, too. So there are several programs that go on there. The one that I mentioned was the radiology class. And radiologists spend all day, every day, looking at films of you know, tiny, tiny portions of people's bodies looking for things that are going wrong, right? They're looking for cells, they're looking for evolution. So they're, they're very, very highly visually trained as are art historians and conservatives. Right? So they have that in common, and that's a really interesting sort of common thread. I think one of the reasons they wanted to start the radiology program with the art, with the art museums is that in medical training, as far as I understand in the USA, it becomes very, spe very specialized very quickly. And as a radiologist, you're looking for one thing. You're looking for something that's going wrong. You're looking for something you can recognize that will lead you immediately to a conclusion. So you see one thing, oh, it's, it's this thing that's going wrong. We see another thing, it's this thing that's going wrong. Therefore, we need to do X, Y, or Z. It's that cognitive movement from seeing to conclusion that they wanted to challenge, actually. So in art history, the, one of the fundamental premises is that you don't do that, is that you look and you do not form a conclusion. You keep looking and you keep asking questions until ultimately you can bring together contextually an argument for what you're seeing. So it was a very different kind of cognitive move. Uh, it's very hard, apparently, for American-trained doctors to see something and then not immediately form a conclusion about what's going on, about what type of person you might be dealing with, about who they are, about what's going on with their body, with their whole body. They're looking at just one part. So this is one of the reasons they wanted to use uh, an art historical approach to looking uh, with radiologists, was to sort of open things up so that you don't get the situations where people are uh, making mistakes or drawing conclusions too narrowly. 
it's also a break for them. I mean, they spend all day looking at very small films. So during the pandemic, that was one of the things we did. We took that online. We gave them, gave them art breaks so that they could you know, have a little break. Thank you. My name is Takehito. I'm a scholar in higher education. Beginning of the presentation, you mentioned about death of humanity in U.S. higher education. At the same time, you showed us the example you collaborated with professional faculty across the department at Harvard. How did you establish ties with individual faculty or professionals? Uh, because university is usually decentralized. So did you work with the provost, dean, or vice president? Uh, please share your experience. Thank you. Yeah. I think there are several people in the room who could speak to just how decentralized Harvard is better than I can even. <laughs> but you're absolutely right, it's incredibly decentralized. So I think it's been the result of a very long period of reformation <clears throat> excuse me, uh, of the museum. So as you saw, the 2014 building, that was a new building. That was at least 10 years in the making, and now we're almost 10 years on from there. So yes, we definitely had support from the top of the university, from the, from the president and from the provost office. And we have a provost office for the arts. And they have various, um, you know, various institutional mechanisms for trying to uh, disseminate the arts throughout the campus. In 2008, they had a task force on the um, arts at Harvard, which was very strong in its findings positively for the role of the arts in, in constructing educational programs that uh, you know, are holistic. So we had that kind of institutional support. But actually, it was really pushing from it. It's coming from that, from that top, as it were. But from us pushing out was just as important. And each curator has a range of relationships with faculty members they work with closely. Uh, I actually work with a neuroscience professor who reached out to me. Uh, I work very uh, frequently with a history of art faculty who, of course, you know, we have a lot of contact with. So there's individual connections too. There's also our Department of Academic and Public Programs, and they are very explicitly uh, constructed so that they reach out to faculty members who were teaching and make sure they share the information about the museums with the faculty in a systematic way. And um, word has got out that teaching in the Art Study Center with art objects is very popular and it brings the students. So faculty learn about how to do this. We do have a person who is dedicated to helping faculty learn how to teach with original objects of art. It's, it's, of course, not something that everybody's done before. So we, we have people to support that work too. And we also will guest teach in other people's classes if they want us to do that, if they you know, don't want to. You know, it's a long process learning how to teach with art and how to select objects that are going to work. One other important thing that we have is um, a study gallery where faculty are able to select objects from the collections to have them installed for the entire semester in this gallery. And then they can bring their classes multiple times to that space, or students can come by themselves to do assignments there. So I think the answer is we have multiple, multiple levels at which we try and hit the university and the university to get the university to support us. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this was a wonderful um, lecture. Uh, my name is Uliana Dabrova. Uh, I'm from Moscow State University. Um, as you probably know, there is a big problem with the um, forgeries in Russian art market. <laughs> and I know that there is no one on earth who knows art better than restorators. So do you teach, do you work with forgeries? Do you teach authentication? This was my question. And another question is, do you work with AI to identify uh, that? Mm -hmm. Forgeries, of course, yeah, great question. Um, topic since the very beginning at the Harvard Art Museums, actually. The reason that the Strauss Center was established was that Edward Forbes, uh, the first director of the museums early in the 20th century, as many Americans were, was trying to build a collection in America and he went to Europe and he was duped a couple of times. He was sold forgeries. Um, it happened in Italy, I know. And the result of that was uh, he came back and he was determined that this shouldn't happen. Um, and so for him, the answer was to get down to the scientific study of things like pigments and materials to really um, understand how the artwork was made so that, you know, forgeries 
would be, you know, you could identify them. So that's how the Strauss Center really kind of started. Um, do we work with forgeries today? Yes, we do. Um, and sometimes they crop, actually they crop up in um, the uh, uh, art, uh, science and the practice of art history class. We use them there too. So by actual physical objects. Do we use AI for identification? I don't think yet, but it's a great question and I will take it to my colleagues. I, I don't think we have. Um, but it may be going on in other corners of the university. Yeah, I, I was in Boston two weeks ago, actually, and I didn't go to Harvard Art Museum. I really, you know, believe myself for it. But I went to the MFA, and, and they have this wonderful exhibition about Hoxai mm -hmm. that, of course, uh, is, is quite well popular these days uh, in, in the Boston area. Um, there was obviously, you know, it was interesting because the, when you obviously go through this exhibition, uh, you, you, you feel the influence of your in Japan on, on a lot of different different pieces of arts, and there was actually a section about uh, Japanese mm -hmm. in French or Japanese yeah. in, in English. And you know, when I was just thinking about you, know, when you look about you know how uh, the influence of Japanese architects around the world, there was also Japanese art and, and contemporary art. Um, we might actually argue that your know, contemporary art in Japan, the Japanese contemporary art, should be known a bit better outside of Japan. And I know that, for example, of course, Norman is doing his fair share. Uh, to do this. But so my question is, um, do you believe from your vantage point, obviously, you know, being mm. in the US, but of course knowing very well uh, Asian and Japanese art in particular, do you see some, some kind of uh, emerging trends of this kind of a uh, mm. second wave Japanism going on here? I'm just dreaming. That's such a great question. Uh, and it's one that I don't feel I have have a fully formed answer to because in part it is, as you say, emerging and ongoing. <clears throat> we have um, we have faced the issue uh, being you know three constituent museums where we have historically very strong museum of European and American art that um, often Japanese art is conceived of through the lens of Japonismo as if you know Japonismo is Japanese art. I'm afraid that is still going on in the USA. And it's a problem that you know since 2020 we've actually really been able to um, articulate as something that has a really serious implications for what goes on in the real world. So we have worked on, you know, first wave Japanese uh, within the museums. We have uh, certainly, um, we've made some acquisitions and we've done some programming around uh, first wave Japanese, if we put, put it like that. But we're very conscious that, you know, it, it is, it's, it's the, um, there's the desire, the need for more focus on on contemporary Japanese art now. I think one of the other issues that comes in then is do you, you know, focus country by country or do you focus you know, by, by time period? So it tends to be that we end up talking about Asia writ large rather than, than Jap Japan um, in a contemporary context. But certainly that is the need. And I am encouraged that you know, since especially 2020 in, in the USA, um, it is now much easier to make the argument for the representation of contemporary Japanese art in America than it was pre-2020, I have to say. I mean, so it's, it's taken a very unfortunate series of events to get here, but I think we're here. Um, so I'm excited to see that take off. So Rachel, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and for letting our audience know that Japanese art, Japanese language, civilization, history is alive and well at Harvard. Um, so thank you for that and congratulations on the Prince uh, Shotoku collaboration which I think is a wonderful example of how to do collaboration. So I have a very specific, perhaps silly question on uh, Prince Shotoku. You had the slide with all the different uh, objects that were inside mm -hmm. the work. Yeah. Do we know how they got them all in there and how they were organized? I, I'm just, it's a very basic question. The question. But I'm extremely curious about that. Absolutely. So are we. So we know, we know how they were put inside there. The sculpture was created in the, in the round and then it was split. I mean, it sounds like a very violent thing to do. It is a very violent thing to do. The body of the sculpture was split. So it kind of opened up, um, I don't know how many English... British English residents we have here, it was kind of like an Easter egg, you know, with one half, one half, like that. Um, and so the front half is actually a little bit bigger than the back half. And so all of the objects we believe were placed into the front half of the body. And then the back half was joined back together. And so actually you cannot see the join. It's incredible workmanship. You just, you can't see it. 
When uh, they were taken out in 1937, the um, conservator at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, who was actually a visiting Japanese specialist, opened the sculpture from the bottom through the feet. Um, so cut a hole in the bottom of the sculpture, and then the objects were, according to the records, which show, were pulled out by hand. And, for, and there, are th there are three different accounts of how this happened. None of them quite correspond, um, but apparently they were, they were pulled out, but they were not recorded in the order they came out. So we just have this list of objects that were, came, out of the, uh, came out of the sculpture. So we too have always wanted to know, you know, what was where? With, you know, was the eyes in the chest in this sort of important area near the heart? Was there anything in the head? So we've done various things. We, we've measured the internal space which we could do thanks to the CT scanner, and we've um, measured all of the objects, and we made actually physical replicas um, of, of this uh, to absolutely the size and the same kind of paper, this kind of thing, of all of the objects, and we've, we've done sort of physical mock-ups of where things might have been. What we can conclude is that it was tight in there. <laughs> they were not moving. Um, and indeed, some of the paper objects, they've got staining on the outside from where they were in contact with the wood of the sculpture, so we know those were on the outside. And other things that are really pristine were probably on the inside. There's a couple that have tiny wormholes that went through both two objects, their little mushkui in, in, in pages of the of little documents, so we know those were together, but we're not quite sure yet how exactly everything was inside. Um, so his question is, um, you know, just looking at the museums as a whole, um, what percentage of um, the collection are from Asia? And if, can you tell us kind of the, like the breakdown of countries? Mm -hmm. And also, um, you know, how do you, you know, I'm sure you have lots in your collection. How do you evolve or revolve the, your collection uh, within the museums, uh, especially the permanent collection? Great. Thank you so much. Um, please do come visit. Let us know if you're coming. Um, so the Asian collections, uh, we break them down roughly China, Japan, Korea. Uh, we have very little uh, material from Southeast Asia. Um, and South Asia is a separate department. So for East Asia, uh, Japan has around 10,000 objects. And about 5,000 of those are Japanese prints. Uh, Korea uh, has 1,000 objects, about, and China has, I think, slightly more, about 13,000 objects. So, you know, we're a, a smaller part of the larger museums. I said earlier we have together, the three museums, about 300,000 objects, which is, is, is not far short of the Art Institute of Chicago. <laughs> um, and if you've been there, you know that that's a much bigger building. So uh, we, we we're running kind of a tight ship there, but the Asian objects are, are well represented. It's an old collection. Uh, it's, it was established early in the in the collecting history in the United States, and so we do have some remarkable highlights, um, and and we do have good coverage, uh, especially if uh, we're, our next step is to. Uh, catalog our collection of Surimono prints, which are these incredible luxury prints that have been in the museum since the 1930s. We have about a thousand of these, and they're rumored to be the best collection in the country, but no one's seen them because they're not cataloged yet. So that's our next step. So, um, uh, collections, the evolution of collections, collection strategy. We actually do publish our collection strategy on our website for um, the person who's managing acquisitions for Japan. About every five years, we uh, write a new collecting policy that is responding to both the historical collections, so how things might relate to what we already have, what we could, what strengths we can bring, what holes we can fill, but then also looking forward, what is it that we're wanting to do? What is most relevant? What is the demand? And so I've been doing, you know, so both of those things and have acquired in areas as disparate as, as Kamakura period Buddhist painting and 20th century Japanese painting. Um, we haven't acquired very strongly on the sort of um, more 3D, uh, 3D uh, objects side. That's in part because we respond also to the teaching requirements of our faculty. So um, at the moment, we're looking at 20th century, uh, 20th and 21st century. 
We have a lot of um, many museum specialists here, uh, both from the States as well as uh, locally in Japan. Um, and I think uh, from Asia Society perspective, we'd like to do more collaboration. We have 16 centers globally, and um, I think we definitely would like to do more collaborations together. Would you have any advice to how to go about and doing it? Because we usually, you know, a lot of our... Um, breakfast or our talks it's through our you know vast network that we have but um if we were to you know if we didn't have that connection or um you know if we did or we didn't what would be your advice for future collaborations i suppose um it depends a little on what kind of events or what kind of goals um and what types of institutions or individuals you're trying to collaborate with um Speaking from my own experience, I, I guess it's, we just go back to basics, and it is the personal connections that um, that have made our the, the collaborative program around Prince Shotoku work. It's been strong personal um, connections there. Um, I guess shared interests, shared goals, uh, being very clear at the beginning what your questions are, what your goals are, but also having the capacity to remain open to a certain extent. Because uh, my experience with the Prince Shiltoku project, for example, is that you might think you know where you're going. You might think you have a very specific goal in mind, but actually remaining open and taking in as much as you can from other points of view leads to this kind of, I mean, it's a very obvious point, but it leads to things you can't anticipate. And, uh, and it just keep cycling from there. So I think remaining open and in good communication, those, are, those have been my two big takeaways from it. Yeah. Have there been any in the past and possible, uh, possibly plans for the future exhibition and research related to the marvelous mid eighth century uh, Shoso in repository collection? Indeed, they have. Um, so our key faculty collaborator, Professor Yukio Lippet, has been working on the Shoso In. Um, our questioner from Kyoto might be aware that we recently hosted a one-day symposium on the Shoso In uh, that was webcast as well. He has been teaching on the subject and is, I think, preparing a book manuscript too. So there's a lot of work going on around Shoso In at the moment at, at Harvard. Uh, we do not, of course, have terribly many objects related to the Shoso in in our, in our, in our purview, but um, it's, it's in a way, the fact that we don't have objects from that period in our collections makes it all the more important that we're able to contribute to that work. During that time, um, we were actually at the, uh, at the Harvard Art Museums, we were able to host a curator from Nara National Museum, um, Kitazawa Natsuki-san, for six weeks at the Harvard Art Museums. Um, thanks to the, uh, the support of the Japan Museums Associ Association. And so she was with us for six weeks. And she's one of the people who prepares that exhibition every year. Uh, so she was part of the symposium and, and I did an interview with her while she was with us, which was webcast too, all about the very special preparations that go on for the Shoso In exhibition. This is all great, what you're talking about and what you're doing and the uh, you're moving on and, and getting more and more exchanges. Um, is there any plans or ideas to formalize where you have like uh, residencies in Asian countries and uh, people are coming, or grants and people are coming to Harvard where you have uh, like a physical space uh, or your own building for to host residencies and work studios? Uh, are you talking about artist residencies and or also uh, nowadays, innovator, incubator. So it could be a researcher, artist, uh, any uh, aspect of that, you know. Sure, sure. I, I think that at the museums per se, that's a little beyond our current capacity, but it's not beyond the, the capacity of Harvard writ large. So this is one of the advantages of being nested within the university, is that we're able to, to contribute to hosting people who are coming to other parts of the university. So for example, the Reichauer Institute has this long established program of supporting scholars and thinkers who come for usually a year. 
Uh, and so we can help host them. Uh, the Asia Center, the Weatherhead Center, there's various centers at Harvard who do that kind of work. And then we, we assist. But um, hosting ourselves, actually hosting um, the curator from Nara National Museum is the first time we've done that since 2014. And I think it was very successful. So I'm hoping that you know, in the future we might be able to formalize more programs so that there is more exchange. It's exactly what we need, it's what we need. Um, is to keep that, inter that international, um, those channels open. It keeps us enlivened, it keeps us up to date and, and working with the people who are our close, who might be physically far away, but are actually our closest colleagues. <laughs>